for a week in mid-October, our community, our university, and every person sitting here today will be at the epicenter of the American political universe. The eyes of the nation and the entire world will be focused on the events unfolding here at UNLV and essentially right where I'm standing here today. On October 19th, 2016, UNLV will be the site for the final presidential debate to occur in this election season. And every one of you here will have a front row seat to what is likely to be the most exciting, most viewed, and most contentious presidential debate in American history. When I first heard that UNLV was selected as the host site for the final 2016 debate, I was so excited. I, it's kind of hard to describe how excited I was. My little kid came out. Fortunately, um, we captured some video footage of it. Can you go back one slide to my video? There we go. Um, I was so excited. My little, inner little kid came out and participating in a presidential debate in some small way was a dream come true for me and the opportunity of a lifetime. In order to understand why I was so excited, you have to know a little bit more about me. Uh, I watched my first presidential debate in 1988 when I was 12. Uh, that was the Bush versus Dukakis debates and portions of those debates are still, uh, I still remember them as if they happened yesterday. Um, later on, uh, a couple years later, I went to high school and I, with memories of that debate still seared into my mind, I joined our high school's debate team. Um, that's right, it's here for the debate team. Um, the, uh, the earliest lesson that I learned from participating in debate was that if you research a lot and you know everything that you possibly can about your topic, you're more likely to win. And I liked winning. So I researched a lot. Uh, our research eventually got turned into usable evidence for uh, debates when we put them onto note cards, these four by six note cards. And when you get enough note cards, you need to organize them. So uh, we organized our note cards into these little plastic recipe boxes. And um, my first recipe box filled up pr pretty quickly, and so I had to expand into a second. And before long, I had far too many recipe boxes to carry around anymore. Uh, and so I had to expand again, this time into a briefcase. That's right, I carried a briefcase full of debate evidence around in the 10th grade. And in case you didn't know it, that's basically the golden ticket to social acceptance and popularity through, throughout high school. <clears throat> this is a momentous event for our university. Uh, my obsession that with debate that began when I was just a kid is now translated into the focal point of my professional life. It's almost surreal for me to say it now, but I've been involved in policy debate as a competitor, judge, coach, and teacher now for over 25 years. And because UNLV was selected as the host site for the 2016 debate, the final 2016 debate, I get to share the activity that I love with the university that I love. Um, so today I'm here to talk to you about presidential debates. And I want to begin by uh, adding some context to the conversation, describing one of the most important moments in presidential debate history. Uh, I want to talk about how presidential debates are a kind of foundational expression of American democracy. And I want to talk about how they affect each and every one of you. So in order to understand why this is so momentous for our university, it's helpful to understand some of the basics of presidential debates. And I want to begin by saying that you, some of you may be surprised to find out that presidential debates are not some ancient phenomenon that emanate from uh, the American Revolution. Instead, they're a product of 1960. Um, and they've only been around for really uh, a short time. In fact, the first presidential debate to ever occur happened on September 26, 1960, between John F. Kennedy and Richard Nixon. Uh, that first presidential debate uh, that first presidential debate really just changed the trajectory of, of, of American history. Uh, the final thing that I want to say about the basics of presidential debates is perhaps the most important, which is since 1976, uh, it's become enshrined in the public as an expectation that candidates will participate in presidential debates. And every candidate nominated by a major party has done so. Um, 
And on the rare occasion when presidential candidates have resisted participating in the debates, they've eventually been persuaded to do so. In 1992, for instance, when George H.W. Bush resisted participating in a three-way debate between himself, independent candidate Ross Perot, and Democratic candidate um, Bill Clinton, uh, protesters began showing up at his rallies in chicken outfits, holding up signs that said, there's no debate about it, he is Chicken George. Bush eventually ended up participating in all three scheduled debates that year. The tradition of presidential candidates participating in debates began with the very first debate in our nation's history, uh, which also turns out to be one of my favorites. And so if you'll allow me, indulge me for just a moment while I talk about a debate that I'm a little bit obsessed with, like if I were a seven-year-old, this would be my Frozen. Um, <laughs> and in September 26, 1960, in a small television studio in Chicago, Illinois, presidential debates were born in America. The two candidates showed up that night and agreed to debate in front of a television audience of nearly 67 million Americans. That debate, like I said, changed the course of American history. It's important that I set the stage for that debate because it did occur like 38 years before most of you here were born. But fortunately, that's a somewhat easy task as the challenges that America was facing in the 1960s are remarkably similar to the challenges that we face now today. Many Americans in 1960 felt that our nation was on the precipice of some extreme form of social change. Americans in the 1960s, like today, were afraid of the future, but also inextricably drawn to it. In fact, many Americans in 1960 believed, as many of us do today, that what we need in America is a political revolution. Someone told me that Bernie was popular with the freshmen, so I'm happy that worked. <clears throat> the, the first presidential debate to ever occur on television was notable for its lopsidedness. That debate turned out to be an unmitigated disaster for Nixon and turned out to provide a huge boost to Kennedy. There were three essential distinctions between the candidates that really mattered and, and affected the outcome of that debate. They were first, Prep, method of preparation, second, crafting arguments to prove leadership character, and third, appearance. All three of those factors came together to produce a perfect storm that worked against Nixon and for Kennedy that night. When Nixon was on the campaign trail uh, a month before the debate, um, he arrived at a campaign stop in North Carolina. And as he stepped out of the car, he smashed his knee against the edge of the car door. He hit his knee so hard that the bruised area eventually developed a very dangerous and serious staph infection. And he was hospitalized for 12 critical days that he could have been campaigning with his knee immobilized, taking daily antibiotic shots. And he lost nearly 20 pounds during the time that he was hospitalized, he was so ill. When Nixon showed up to the debate that night on September 26, he stepped out of the car and banged his previously injured knee again on the edge of the car door. <laughs> Witnesses who saw it happen said they watched the color drain from his face. That night on television during the debate, Nixon appeared pale. <laughs> his gray shirt and suit blended into the gray television backdrop. Uh, he had refused the services of the TV studio's makeup artist and had a serious five o'clock shadow, and uh, he perspired heavily. When then mayor of Chicago, Richard Daley, saw Nixon on television that night, he said, my God, they've embalmed him before he's even died. <laughs> Kennedy, on the other hand, appeared handsome, tan, and well-rested. Nixon later wrote in his memoirs of Kennedy's appearance that night, Quote, I'd never seen him looking so fit. On top of that, Nixon had prepared to debate alone, secluded in his hotel room, reviewing his debate briefing books. Kennedy, on the other hand, had prepared with a cadre of his most trusted advisors, reviewing the issues out loud, answering hypothetical debate questions, and refining his answers. While Nixon had merely prepared to debate, Kennedy had prepared to debate on the medium of television. While Nixon merely refuted Kennedy's arguments, 
Kennedy addressed the American public directly and offered a positive vision for the future of our nation. Kennedy's answers to questions on important national issues ranging from the federal budget to education policy reflected well upon him. And the content and style of his answers to those questions impressed a great many Americans. Now we all know that the three keys to success in a presidential debate are, are, are preparation, proof of leadership character, and appearance. Given Nixon's failures and Kennedy's successes on all three of those counts, it's no surprise then that Kennedy went on to close the 1% gap that he was trailing Nixon and went on to win the 1960 election. Gallup polling in 1960 showed that about 6% of American voters, or 4 million voters in 1960, made the decision on who to vote for based solely on watching the presidential debates. And three quarters of those voters, or 3 million Americans, voted for Kennedy. When you learn that the 1960 election was decided by just over 100,000 votes, 112,000 to be precise, the importance of the first 1960 debate becomes glaringly obvious. It changed the course of that election and the course of American history. Now we all know that presidential debates can affect the outcome of an election, but we need to take that finding and narrow it down from a nationwide social impact to understanding how watching presidential debates can affect individual citizens like us. Yes, this is the what's in it for me section of the speech, so it's time to wake up and pay attention because the answer to what's in it for me is pie. That's right, and everyone loves pie. That's a lot of pie. In this case, I mean political information efficacy. Sorry, sorry. <clears throat> political information efficacy is a measure of how confident you are in your political knowledge. And studies consistently demonstrate that the, the individuals who watch presidential debates have measurably higher levels of political information efficacy. And that correlates to your levels of political engagement and your willingness to persuade others of your political viewpoint. Another well-established effect of watching presidential debates for individuals is a reduction in political cynicism. Now, I'm sure all the cynics out there are like, yeah, sure it does. But this is social science, and these people have numbers to prove that they are right. And the data consistently demonstrates that watching political election debates has a measurable effect on reducing political cynicism. Ultimately, this impact is widespread because millions of Americans watch presidential debates. In fact, as you can see here, on average, the average viewership for presidential debates hovers around 60 million. And that's a lot of Americans. <clears throat> It's really good when you consider the fact that like, only about 35 million Americans regularly watch television award shows like the Oscars. But where Americans need to do better is in the percentage of Americans watching presidential debates. Because while the number of Americans watching debates has stayed relatively consistent, the population of America has increased markedly to more than double what it was in 1960, which means that the percentage of us watching presidential debates has steadily declined. It's most, it's, it, the percentage has declined most heavily in the 18 to 25 year old age demographic. Now ultimately, this is something that we can all do something about. We can become ambassadors for presidential debates, spreading the good word of political engagement to friends, family, or if you're like me, any stranger in the grocery store who will listen to you. <laughs> <clears throat> there's another concrete action that everyone here can take. This is what you can do with your pie once you have it. The obvious answer is eat it, because that's why pie exists and it's delicious. But once you have greater political information efficacy, you can make sure that you are registered to vote and go out and vote for the next president of the United States, whoever she or he may be. For you and all these students, there, is, uh, there, are, there are several things that you can do with your pie as well. You can make sure that you're registered to take uh, one of the classes, many classes that are being offered about presidential debates this semester, or that, that, you are, that you can work as a volunteer during the debates. You can literally be part of the community that helps to create the final presidential debate 
of 2016. And that is a once in a lifetime opportunity. <clears throat> this presidential debate phenomenon that we are all, this brings me to my last point, which is that this presidential debate phenomenon that we are all about to engage and participate in is really one of the foundational expressions of American democracy. The American president is the most powerful person in the world. And there's no legal requirement that the president participate, or a presidential candidate participate in the debates. But since 1976, every candidate nominated by a major party has done so. They subject themselves to criticism. They put their ideas to the test. And that is something that no real leader should be afraid to do. Television, presidential debates are televised live events where almost anything can happen. And I think that we'll see that with glaring clarity this year. <clears throat> it's true. <clears throat> uh, in a word, uh, presidential debates matter. They matter, they matter a lot because they help determine the future direction that our nation will take. Now, one thing that might, one thing that I know that unites every person here is that we all care about what happens to America and to the world. As John F. Kennedy so eloquently put it, in the final analysis, our most basic common link is that we all inhabit the small planet. We all breathe the same air, we all cherish our children's future, and we are all mortal. I want to conclude today by recognizing that democracy can sometimes be frustrating. It's tempting to give in to apathy or cynicism or to say, you know what, things are never going to change. But that is something that I refuse to believe. If you didn't care and you didn't believe that things could change, you wouldn't be here right now. You wouldn't be listening to this speech. You wouldn't have enrolled in our world-class university you could have just gone to a different school. <laughs> but you do care. You do believe in the possibility of change. And that is something that unites every one of us. You were all here bound and determined to get a degree from UNLV because you know that it will make a difference in your life or the lives of your family and loved ones, a difference in our community, a difference across our great state, a difference around America or a difference to people all over the world. You are about to embark on an amazing academic adventure and you're planning for the incredible opportunities now laid out in front of you as a future UNLV graduate. We are all united by our desire to make a difference and that is what being a rebel is all about.